how to find the best investment property for you. And we're going to kind of cover off this first bit a bit quickly. It's going to give you a bit of a frame for what we're going to talk about, and then we'll dive straight in. The ultimate goal of every property investor is buying the best property in the best location at the best price. Now, those three things, they make sense, right? That's obviously the goal of everybody. But the big part here is for the buyer brief. This is what is the key point. What is actually your buyer brief? Because the, the best property in the best location at the best price for you, Jeff, is completely different to what's for me. Or a 40-year-old yeah. with $2 million of disposable income um, and equity is going to be different to, you know, an everyday, you know, everyday Joe. <laughs> Or, or Jane as well. We've, oh, Jane. Um, the, the, the thing I think that, yeah, that's that's the thing I see a lot of in the posts in the group. It's that everybody says, okay, where, where is the best where is the best place to buy a property? And, yes. and it's, so, it's so hard. Okay, like the, you can buy the best property, but what, what does that what does that actually mean? Like what is, what is, base, what is your brief? Because if you don't have your brief, you, you can't really understand what the best property is for you. So I know yeah. that seems really basic, but I think it's the thing that a lot of people they want to go straight to the straight to the end point, which until you've done that work yourself, yeah, it's a, it doesn't make any sense, right? And also, your goal, like your goal, is not to look at what this next purchase is. Your goal is to look at what is this next purchase that's going to allow me to get into the next one. So yeah. whenever you speak to your mortgage broker, whenever you speak to your buyer's agent, whenever you speak to your professionals, say, hey, just letting you know, this is not my last purchase. I want to know what this purchase needs to be with my current borrowing capacity and situation to allow me to get to the next one. Because if you don't have those conversations, you'll say, hey, I have a borrowing capacity of 900000 Perfect. Let's go buy you a $900,000 property. They'll go out there and do it. Then you'll try and go for another one and you won't be able to buy it. And then you'll have a property that may be a little bit too cash flow negative. And then, you know, most people stop at two or three properties. This, well, this is the fundamentals, right? We're talking about the F of the fab. So the fundamental drivers of the demand, these are the things that push demand forward. So what you can do as an individual is go out there and score each of these points, one to five. So I'm looking at three individual suburbs because that's what you've done. You've gone to the, you've gone and looked at all the research, which is what this is, the fundamentals, the, the key. And then you just rank each of these points. So population, who are the people living there? Are they going to drive capital growth? Um, employment, is there a diverse workforce? Have people got money? What kind of money have they got? What kind of jobs have they got? Where is the money coming from? Are people leaving the city? Are they coming in? Um, projects, what is the infrastructure coming in? What projects are going on? What's the council doing? Are they adding a new swimming pool, a new aquatic center, a new theater system? Like, what are they doing? Um, what investments are they making? What do the roads look like? What are, um, All of that stuff. Then desirability is exactly what you were talking to there before, Jeff. Cafes, is it trendy? What are drawing owner occupiers to this location and what's pushing them away? Like if you go to a town and it's got a ratty old, you know, um, you know, tennis court and that's all there is, no one goes there, that might not be like that's not desirable. So that gets a one. <clears throat> And then minus it, it, the supply sounds, of stuff. Sounds more of an art, this sort of side of things. Or I, I, there's not no. Also, um, well, oh god, um, no. I mean, no. It it's art and science. And this is this is the thing. Where is it? There. All of this is art, but art and science. There is no specific data. Like you can't put a number. You can't really put a number on these type of things. Um, here's actually a great little comment that's just come up from brian join the local community facebook groups and it will give you a great window into the area beautiful yep like that's going to give you some really really good insights of people what people hate what people love um i love that one great thanks thanks brian um so anyway this is the fundamental drivers this is not what we're talking about here um the analysis is the next one so f a b so this is the analysis this is where you found the key areas you've graded them now now we've got to start looking at where is the data going are the days on markets trending down you fixed yeah. the slide as well joe i'm impressed <laughs> I've I've spent a lot of time on this <laughs> too much time yeah inventory levels what are they looking like listing volumes are the vacancy rates low enough is that have you got enough rentals what is the yield does the yield actually give you what you want like if you're looking at an area that is a three percent yield and you need a five done there you go. See you later. I've got to move on to the next one. 
what is the rent proportion? If there's a large percentage of renters, the area is just not going to have potentially as not as much growth. You want more owner occupiers, that's a better thing. Are people discounting? And what is the supply and demand of the area? Can, so can I The uh, reliable data. So what does what's the definition of reliable data? So like there's not enough sales. There's not enough listings coming onto the market. So with fifth, like there's 15,000 suburbs in Australia. Yep. There's a lot. Um, but there's also a lot that just don't fit. Like there's a whole heap in WA. There's a whole heap in Northern Territory. There's a whole heap in Northern, Tassie, Northern Tassie. South Australia, a number in Western Tasmania. Like there's just not enough sales and data to, to actually be able to, come up to with a decision of this is a good location and this is worthwhile so can you um can you release what the statistically reliable number is or is that is that joe's secret source that he can't tell no it's just different sales. things right like just sales volume and um yeah this is a, it, <laughs> yeah. yeah so like uh, sales enough. volumes listing volumes it's it's a whole like if there's not enough data there it's just not you can't really make a decision like if there's three sales in a suburb one That's month and it's 500,000, a million, and then 2 million. And then next month, it's 200,000, 200, and then 200. So, well, I can't really say the median price is 700,000. This is the goal, right? The goal is to figure out what you, what you don't want. So, what you have left is the dream property, right? So, it's more of a reductionist method. So, you look at your budget. How much money have you got? So, I've got... Five hundred thousand dollars. I yep. need a yield. I've spoken to my broker, and he said, "Joe, you need to get a minimum yield of four and a half percent." Okay, so that's where I need to go. Uh, Location-wise, hell no, I'm not buying in Northern Territory. Okay, well, I'm not buying in Northern Territory. I'm not buying in here. Here, I don't like this. I've got some preconceived notion about this area. Okay, um, <clears throat> then you start to whittle it down. So there's fifteen thousand suburbs. 3,800 have reliable data. You overlay that with your budget, and you start to cut things down. Then when you've got your two to three locations, that's when you can jump in a car, jump on a plane and start going to those locations and assessing them. And so <clears throat> I did this, right? I did the research. I found my locations. I used all the data to find where to go. Um, but most importantly, I got my little butt over there, jumped in, uh, jumped on a plane, flew down to Victoria, drove around to all of the areas and selected the few that I liked. And then I got to one area in particular um, and the data was all there. It had the fundamentals. It had good um, infrastructure going in. There was stuff in the pipeline. But when I got there, I had a chat with one of the hotel owners, and he was just the most miserable person ever. He's like, "This town sucks." Is uh, you know, there's they're saying they're talking about all this infrastructure coming in. It's not actually coming. The jobs aren't here. The politic, like the council, is doing this. Like he gave me a full rundown and this is very important. Like you got to have conversations with these people to understand it. Then I had more conversation with the cafe owners and all of this. And then I sat, sat down in the street and I'm like, this doesn't feel like a good suburb. Like this isn't a place that I actually like. I don't know why anyone would want to live here. And for me, if you get a bad feeling about something, I'm, I'm just not going to put, I spent the money and the research and the, the fuel to get down there. But for me, I'm like, that's, that's a no go zone for me. I'm just not going to buy in that location. And obviously, you know, I'm not going to share that location, but you can figure it out yourselves. <laughs> but for me, <laughs> boots on the ground saved, saved my butt because other people would say, oh, this is a great data. You know, this is all fantastic. The council's doing this thing. You call up the council. Yeah, there's delays in this, delays in that. So you've got to do your deal due diligence on the area and um, chat to local people as well. Yeah, and, and sort of to, to that as well, see if it aligns with your kind of tolerance of risk because if you're hearing yeah. that kind of conversation from multiple people, then then the data might look fantastic. But if if the people in that town aren't particularly fond of living there, then, then what is the risk and that there's going to be other people that will have that same approach and owner-occupiers won't move in and, and sort of um, will pick up, make sure that there does sort of see growth because if, if it's not desirable, then why are people going to move there and pay more for the property? I suppose. Yeah, and inf investment in locate, like investment for small businesses is very important. Like if you, if you walk up a main street and all of the businesses have been renovated and upkept and look beautiful that mm. people have faith in that suburb but when yeah. they're not a little bit yeah it's a little bit too much of a risk we rules okay 
This is what you need to have when you're buying property. So again, just think you've got a massive plate here of every single property. My goal is to remove all of the junk so that I'm left with the gold, right? Like I'm panning for gold here. So I'm not going to have people, I'm not going to look at properties that are above 600,000 when my budget's 500,000. I'm not going to look at properties above four, you know, below 4% yield. I'm not going to look at properties that are in a flood zone, that are in a buyer zone, that are in a T-junction. So a T-junction is where the road meets and headlights just constantly go through your front windows just yes. all day. You call it a T-junction, a T-section? Like what's this T-junction? Oh, same, uh, it's the same know. thing. I don't know. I'd call it same T-section. Thing. Yeah, sorry. Okay. There you go. T-section. T- there you go. Potatoes, potatoes. <laughs> um, <laughs> no main roads. So you want to? You don't want to be buying on a heavy, heavy main road. There are some roads that are like somewhat main, somewhat, you know, they're fine. Um, you know, you just think, go, get, get on the boots on the ground. Stand on the road. Is this too loud? Is this too much? Yes. Do, no, do you it's consider- up to you. You know that main road that goes, um, I think it's uh, through Woodville and Semif, Semif, uh, not, yeah, Woodville. Would you consider that a main road? I don't know exactly which one it is, but you probably know the one I'm talking <laughs> about. <laughs> no, Jeff. How the hell would I know that? Well, I you know, know that because main I, road, yeah, one I don't yeah. really know about, but that one? Another, yeah, that I, could, I could give you the name of the road, but yeah. Yeah, you can find, I, I yes. If it, like main borderline. north, whatever it is, main south road, yeah, that's a main road. Like, there is, like if it's yellow on Google Maps, that's okay. typically a, a, a main road. But okay. that, that would be cool. borderline for me. I'd be like, if it was a cracking deal, like maybe a corner block, but okay. Uh, Joe's rules, he, he would say no. Yes, I would say I would say no. Because if I'm an owner occupier, I'm not gonna find that attractive. If I've got if I've got yeah, on a, not, not on a main road. No covenants, no easements, no encumbrances, no caveats. Now, this is actually more to do with the contract itself, like when you actually get the contract. Um I've actually written down these things because for some reason, the a difference between a covenant and an, a caveat is always tricking me up. So I yeah, wrote I gonna, them I down. Gonna say, give, give, us, give us the um, definitions of these things. A covenant is a promise that must be kept. Like you can't paint the house this color, no pets allowed type of material used. A caveat is this is a legal injunction placed on the registration of dealings with the title. So these are bad. You don't want this. So this is like a spouse that owns half the property has put a caveat on the title to say, no, you can't sell that. Or a bank, In, for example. Or a bank. Yeah, well, banks have a caveat over the... Is that right, Jeff, from your bo- broking background? Yeah, yeah. well, the, the caveat is they have a, an, an ownership. So, I mean, I don't know if they, they place a caveat on the property, but yeah. They, a, a, they put it yeah. on the title. They got yeah. the first right of refusal for the mortgage. Yep. Um, the other one is encumbrances. Um, now, an encumbrance is the right for someone else to use the land legally. So let's say you do a subdivision. Um, there's like a, a battle axe subdivision. You have the right to use that um, that roadway, right? You, The back person at the back block is allowed to drive up and down that roadway, hmm. that kind of thing. Um, another one is like in farmland, I have rights to access the hydrant on there and do whatever I want, blah, blah, blah. So those type of things. Now, I don't want them on my title because it stops me from doing something. So another example is I had a, I was looking at a deal absolutely perfect. It had the right frontage. It, had, it wasn't in a fire. It wasn't in a flood. It didn't have any easements on it. Um, then I looked on the title and it had a covenant on there that didn't allow the property to, it didn't allow this exact street to be subdivided in any way. So it ticks the box for subdivision, but on the title, it wasn't allowed to be subdivided. So was, was that this, in, was that a one in South Australia, Joe? I think. Yeah, yeah, one in South Australia. I think, yeah. I've, I think I've seen that one. You've spoken about that one before. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's a perfect example of do all your due diligence because the agent's touting this thing as a, as a project that you can go out there, look, you're not going to knock it down anytime soon because by that time you're going to do that, I'm going to have retired and <laughs> living my best life and you're and, not going to know. And I think you've raised a very important point there is like ve- double check and verify what the real estate agent, if you're doing this yourself, you absolutely have to verify if they're saying sub, like potent, development potential or, yes. or you can you can rent that as a granny flat. You have to make sure that what the agent telling, like there's, They'll put oh. all the disclaimers in there that if, if it doesn't turn out that it is. So you have to verify. I tell you, I tell you what, verify. I've got a, I've got a story, if you've got time, Jeff, um, about oh, there was an go. agent that said it was subdividable 
And he's like, yeah, yeah, it is totally subdividable. And it, it was in a it was in a corner lot, um, but I knew, uh, not a corner lot, uh, a cul-de-sac. So I knew it couldn't be subdivided because the frontage wasn't there. He got a, he got a surveyor to draw up plans to place a house in the back lot to make it look like you could actually subdivide it. And I was oh. like, this is crazy. Why do you think you can subdivide it? So on the, on the, the town, on the plans the, like I called the guy up and I'm like, Hey, you did the things like, what are you doing? And he's like, Oh yeah. They just said, can you draw plans up with a house on the back? And of course I can do that. That's got nothing to do with the actual potential of making that happen. So there's a yeah. lot of dodgy stuff that goes on out there. So you need to trust, but verify all of these things, all of these, make, make sure you, you make sure you check no covenants, easements An easement is access to water uh, and, and access for somebody else as well. Generally it's water. So some back some blocks have a water pipe going through the back of it. So you can't build over the top of it. It's just yeah. like if SA water or if, if Queensland water wants to come in or, or um, Osgrid want to come in, there's a power box, that's an easement. So it's yeah. just so someone else can have access to because that that there. can impact your um your costs with developing because you need you need to figure mm. out an, or even whether it is developable. developable. Well, you can't you can't build over the top of it. So if there's an easement right up the middle of the block, you can't yeah. put one house over the top of it. You can't even put yeah. a shed over the top of it. Literally, it has to be free and clear access for for anyone to do it. So that one's fun. So they're my easement. rules. Um, uh, just quickly, there are five levels of focus for capital growth. Um, start wide and then narrow in. Um, look at, at Australia wide. So Australia, what is going on with inflation? What is going on in, um, what are the other things? Interest rates. What's going on Australia wide? If there's a war, these things impact the entire hopefully, market. Look hopefully at there's not a war in Australia. Gee, that'd be a bit concerning. No, there's not, there's not, yeah. there's not. But if there was... It would affect the entire property market, right? Like COVID. Like COVID dropped the entire property market for a couple of months. And then the government printed billions and billions of dollars. And that liquidity needed to go somewhere. And it went into the Australian wide property market. So it controls the absolute performance. So look at these macro factors because that's affecting everything. Um, but then once you understand the macro, Start to look at the city, um, the city level, city, oh God, city level, city level, and suburb level. This sparkling yep. water is going straight to my head. Um, the location does eighty percent of the heavy lifting for the property growth. Um, street level, ensuring that you're not buying on a hot spot. Sorry, you're buying a hot spot and not a not spot. And then the final piece of the puzzle is the property. What is the actual asset, and are you choosing the right property for that location at the right price? Um, but this is a good question that's come up. Joe, can we expect a buyer's agent to do the research at all five levels, Australia, city, suburb, et cetera? Yes. You are paying them for their knowledge and expertise. If they do not have this knowledge or expertise, get get rid of them. How do, how do, they, how do they demonstrate that, Joe? Is it through reports or is it through mm -hmm. conversation? Like what, what are, how do they demonstrate it's through that? through watching their live sessions like this where they demonstrate their skills and knowledge of <laughs> the five factors. But no, you've got to ask questions about, hey, what are your thoughts on interest rate rising? What, is, How is that going to affect this area? Um, you know, from a city level, what is some of the infrastructure coming into this place? Why is this place so interesting to you? Um, on a street level, what are the fundamentals? Why is this a good street? What are some of the things? I think ask better questions, get better answers. So you've got to become a better question asker um, to get those type of questions. So yeah, yeah. Ask questions about their expertise. Like you, you sit down, like you have a discovery call with these people, you can ask questions. So you, again, you're the one that has the financial future. It's your financial future. It's your keys. You've got to not hand them over. You've got to jump. They've got to jump in the car with you. You're like, Oh no, I'm driving. Thank you very much. Um, you're here to direct me to the best place. And I like, I like to think like, I guide people through the process. I'm hand holding them through the entire journey, making sure that they get the best place and the best property. But here are some of the locals to chat to. So this is what you were speaking about, Jeff. Like, what are you actually like when you go to a low, go to an area? Who who are you speaking with? Who are you trying to get a conversation with? And for me, I'm speak. I'm trying to get a hold of all of these people: local council, town planners architects, structural engineers, real estate agents, property managers, builders, surveyors, insurance providers, business owners, 
cafes, hotels, and restaurants. Now, typically speaking, the um, these people, the property managers and real estate agents, they're a little bit more um, o- open to a conversation. Um, mm-hmm. But hospitality venues, love a chat. Go to the local pub, sit down with a local, have a beer, buy them a beer, and, and just have a chinwag about trying to understand the area. Um, I buy in an area quite a lot of property, so um, I will get in the car with a real estate agent, and it's it's not trying to sell me a property. I'm like, you're not trying to sell me a property right now. I'm not buying anything from you right now. I want you to sell me the suburb, and I want you to tell me the good spots and the bad spots. My job is to walk away from here and understand every single bad spot. Now, what you can do is when you go into your hotel, because you got to stay at a hotel or your motel or your holiday inn, and you get one of those big maps, you know, those things like when you're a kid and you would used to go to the hotel and you'd, you know, be on a big booklet and you rip it out and then you draw silly stuff on it. Oh, yeah. I still do that. <laughs> so me too. Yeah, exactly. You, you never grow it out of that. You grab one of those with your real estate agent and you go street by street with the real estate agent and say, look, I want to see the best things. And I went, I, you know, went, went with a real estate agent recently and he went through absolutely, he was so suburb proud. Now, one thing that I'm going to just take, take a step back. I called all of these people before. So before I jumped and got my little booty over there, I tried to gather as much information at the information gathering stage of fundamentals and analysis and then calling local people. So I called up this agent and I'm like, hey, mate, um, I just want to learn a little bit about your area. He's like, yeah, what? I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm an investor. I just want to learn a little bit more. Oh, look, blah, blah, blah. I don't have time. You just waste. Like, look, mate, if you want to, you know, you just, like just very standoffish. I only serve locals. Get out of here. I don't want your type around here. And I'm like, well, okay, cool. Well, I'm coming over next week. Is it worthwhile saying hello, like popping in and saying hello? And he's like, oh, you're flying down. Oh, I thought you were just a, you know, just a, you know, a time waster that's going to just sit on the phone and waste all my time. No, like I'm from, um, I don't know if anyone knows this. I'm from the Blue Mountains, small little country town where a handshake means a lot, where you go face to face with people and you shake their hand. And that really, you know, gets people, you know, it's, it's respect. It's, it's. Um, this is an interesting question. What question? What question do you ask if the asking price has dropped? Hmm. That is good. Well, that is a good would you, would you just say, I'd just say, like, I've, I've sort of seen, I've been following this property. I've sort of noticed it's dropped. Could you give us some insight as to what, what the reason for that drop was? Would you ask yeah, it that directly? You, yeah. Why did it drop? Yeah. This is, yeah. oh, I see that. And, and I've got RP data. This was listed for 600. It's at 550. Yeah. What happened? And then, like, agents aren't lying scumbags as much as you think. <laughs> um, they'll just tell you because they don't want to be messed around. Hey, um, I got a call today again. Um, do you ever fully believe an agent? No, but trust, trust, but verify, right? Like you can tell when someone's lying because you ask another question that's related to it. Like you, now he'll, he'll have a story and the story will be, um, oh, we actually had two, con- we had a client under contract, um, uh, and, and the contract fell through because of finance. Um, and okay, great. Well, I'm going to be doing a pest and building inspection. Is anything going to come up on the pest and building? Oh, actually, there might be there might be something that's going to come up because I'm like, if it's if it's you know if there's a problem, I'm you know blah blah blah. So the, the stories the story's not adding up because he said finance, and next minute he's kind of shirking. Even if it's just a little tone in the voice, because that that'll sort of tell you that maybe it wasn't the finance that crashed the contract. It was yeah. the the pest and building. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. I see that that shed looks a bit shaky. Like, is there is there any problems with that? I just don't want to waste any of your time if I'm not going to be able to, you know, if it's not going to work.